That's when King Herod got it into his head to go after some of the church members. He murdered James, John's brother, and when he saw how much it raised his popularity ratings with the Jews, he arrested Peter, all during Passover week, mind you, and had him thrown in jail, putting four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. He was planning a public lynching after the Passover. All the time that Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church prayed for him strenuously. Then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. That night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby, and there were guards at the door keeping their eyes on the place. Herod was taking no chances. Suddenly, there was an angel at his side, and light flooding the room. The angel shook Peter and got him up. Hurry! The handcuffs fell off his wrists. The angel said, get dressed, put on your shoes. Peter did it. Then grab your coat and let's get out of here. Peter followed him, but didn't believe it was really an angel. He thought he was dreaming. Past the first guard and then the second, they came to the iron gate that led into the city. It swung open before them on its own, and they were out on the street, free as the breeze. At the first intersection, the angel left him, going his own way. That's when Peter realized it was no dream. I can't believe it. This has really happened. The master sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's vicious little production and the spectacle the Jewish mob was looking forward to. Still shaking his head, amazed, he went to Mary's house, the Mary who was John Mark's mother. The house was packed with praying friends. When he knocked on the door to the courtyard, a young woman named Rhoda came to see who it was. But when she recognized his voice, Peter's voice, she was so excited and eager to tell everyone Peter was there that she forgot to open the door and left him standing in the street. But they wouldn't believe her, dismissing her, dismissing her report. You're crazy, they said. She stuck by her story, insisting. They still wouldn't believe her and said it must be his angel. All this time, poor Peter was standing out in the street, knocking away. Finally, they opened up and saw him and went wild. Peter put his hands up and calmed them down. He described how the master had gotten him out of jail, then said, tell James and the brothers what's happened. He left them and went off to another place. He was put in jail and an angel came and he broke the chains off and he followed him out of King Herod's cage and when they got out of there he disappeared and a and he went to a house and a girl answered the door and she told the girls playing. And we answer, and then Stop. we did answer and open the door. So the story that Lorelai spoke of was Acts 12. And The reason that I talked with her about this story is because I think it's short and powerful and it really has two different takeaways for me. The most obvious one is really the power of prayer and seeing that that the church spent time praying. Um, Peter, it was the night before his trial and they were praying for him and, and the angel came to him and helped him escape from prison. And I think that is shows the power of prayer. But 
What I really like about this is it says the church was earnestly praying to God. And it doesn't say what they were praying about, what they were praying for. If I knew someone that was on trial, I would probably not be praying that um, their prison prison doors be opened and they escape. Um, that probably wouldn't have crossed my mind. I would be praying for a favorable trial for them. Um, that, you know, if depending on what was at stake, that um, the outcome was, was not the worst possible outcome, but the best possible outcome. And so I think the church here, um, I'm, I'm envisioning in my head that, that they're praying that he, you know, doesn't get put to death. Um, for example, and so when Peter came to them, they were not anticipating that that he would have escaped from prison. So what I think is important here is to remember that God has a bigger plan. Um, even you, you may be earnestly praying for one thing, and he's going to answer that prayer in a way that you didn't originally expect. Um, and that it's in a way that may be better than you ever could have hoped for. And so to keep that in mind when you're praying, um, to, to not only pray for the outcome you want, but for the outcome that is what God wants for you. And then to also be looking for that outcome, looking for, for for an opportunity for God to do something better than you imagined and to be able to recognize it when it comes. Um, it's not exactly what you prayed for, but but God answered your prayers in, in a better way that was ever possible. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for your love, and because of Jesus' sacrifice, we know what love looks like. We praise you for being the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that you're the same God who directed Peter's steps and who also directs ours. We praise you and thank you for being our rock, our fortress, our rescuer, our shield, and our salvation. We praise you and thank you for your mercy that it is new every morning. Thank you for hearing us when we pray. Thank you for answering us when we pray. Forgive us when we miss seeing your answers and please help us with our faith and to know that when we pray, we can pray boldly and expect you to hear us and answer us within your will. Help us to keep our eyes open to recognize those answers. Forgive us when we go on with life without acknowledging and thanking you. We thank you for your inspired word and how it our hungry souls. Please be with our Southwest sisters, relatives, and friends in our study of 1 Peter this week. Please open our hearts and minds to your word. We pray for spiritual and physical safety for each of us. It is through Jesus we pray with anticipation and expectation and look for your answers to our every concern. Amen. Amen.